welcome to today's Tuesday topic. Uh, looks like we have another person coming in. Let me let them invite them into the room. Uh, today is the relationship among uh, faculty to faculty incivility and job satisfaction or intent to leave in nursing programs in the United States. Uh, we have uh, Pamela McGee uh, presenting for us. Uh, uh, if you have questions, feel free to enter them into the chat Zoom, or if you can use the, the Zoom feature to raise your hand, and when an appropriate moment arises, we'll recognize you to ask your questions. All right, Dr. McGee, go right ahead. All right, so this was my dissertation study, and it was for my Doctor of Education in Higher Education Leadership and uh, Innovation from Wilmington University. And so the objectives for today is we will be talking about the prevalence and incidence of faculty to faculty and civility. We'll examine the relationship between faculty to faculty and civility and job satisfaction, and also look at faculty to faculty and civility and the intent to leave. And then lastly, explore some uh, strategies for creating a culture of civility. So we are in right now the midst of a perfect storm. So our population is aging with about 10,000 baby boomers turning uh, 65 starting since uh, 2011 and this will continue until 2030. And so what we know about the aging population is that older adults use more healthcare services and this has actually created a nursing shortage. So there's over almost a half a million new jobs for registered nurses in the past decade. So the obvious solution would be to educate more nurses. Unfortunately, the nursing faculty are part of the baby boomer, boomer generation, and 73.9% of nursing faculty will probably retire within the next 15 to 20 or 10 to 15 years. So the need for my study was that we have established there's a nursing shortage and we've established there's a nursing faculty shortage. What we need to do is identify what are some of the factors that lead to faculty attrition. And so one of the things research has shown is that low job satisfaction is associated with a higher intent to leave. Other research has shown that 77% of nurses and other healthcare professionals are concerned about incivility they've encountered, and 44% report that uncivil behavior has occurred for over a year or more. Another study showed five workplace disincentives that were identified that by more than 65% of nursing faculty, which included bullying, belittling, and uncivil behaviors. So what is incivility? So incivility is rude or impolite acts or behavior. And that can include eye rolling or other gestures, isolation or gossiping, yelling at someone or name calling. It can lead to physical or verbal threats. And in the worst situations, it can even include stalking and homicide. So my research questions were, what is the incidence of faculty to faculty incivility? What are the physical and emotional effects of faculty to faculty incivility? And then what's the relationship of faculty to faculty incivility with um, job satisfaction as well as intent to leave? And so the hypothesis for the study was that faculty to faculty incivility will correlate with job satisfaction and intent to leave. So the benefits of the study is that students will actually benefit if the incidence of faculty to faculty incivility decreases, it will actually create a much more positive learning environment and they will also have positive role models. Nursing faculty will benefit because their working environment will improve. Administrators of nursing programs will also benefit because they will have increased productivity of the faculty, better collaboration and communication, and improved faculty and student retention. And then universities will also um, benefit by having a reduction in faculty turnover, improved student retention, and an increase in tuition. So when I did my literature review, I really wanted to take a very broad look of, at incivility. And kind of look at it from many different perspectives to kind of find out what was the scope and what is the incidence of faculty to faculty incivility. So I first looked at incivility in higher education to see whether or not 
incivility is unique to nursing education or is it really something that goes across all parts of all disciplines in higher ed? I also looked at um, student and nursing faculty incivility, so what's occurring in the classroom. I looked at the research for administrator to faculty or faculty to administrator um, incivility in nursing education. I looked at incivility in, within the nursing profession or the workforce, and then looked at the impact of incivility in nursing education and how it impacts the nursing faculty shortage. So in higher education, we do know that academic culture is built on collegiality, but it also is very competitive, which we know from the term publish or perish. The research has shown that women international faculty and faculty of color all experience more incivility in the classroom than other groups. And 75.8% of all faculty, regardless of the discipline, report that student incivility is in their classroom. When we look at nursing, incivility and nursing education, uh, Dr. Cynthia Clark is an expert in incivility and nursing programs, but her focus has mo mostly been between student and faculty. Uh, Clark and Springer developed a conceptual model called the dance of incivility. And so it shows how faculty stress and student stress can create an environment that can actually lead to either civility or incivility. Uh, Heinrich actually coined the, coined the term joy stealing, which described how administrators and faculty can rob an educator's enthusiasm for teaching. And she also found that if uncivil behaviors are not addressed, then the behavior actually becomes condoned. And once it's condoned, that develops into a culture of incivility. When we look at the nursing profession, it's really not known whether incivility starts in nursing education and then the graduates then take that to the nursing workforce or whether incivility begins in the nursing workforce and ultimately works its way down into nursing education. But what we do know is that there has been the term nurses eat their young which has been around for decades. And what that does describes is how new nurses face incivility from their experienced coworkers. Now the Gallup poll has showed that nurses are the most trusted profession since 2002. And when we think of the term, when we think of nurses, we think of caring and compassionate, respectful and patient people. And so the concept of incivility just doesn't seem to go or coincide with nursing. The Code of Ethics, um, ANA Code of Ethics, also states that nurses should be respectful and also are responsible for creating a culture of civility. And then the Joint Commission issued a Sentinel Alert in 2008 stating that uncivil behavior compromises patient safety and urged that all healthcare organizations adopt a zero tolerance for uncivil behavior. And then lastly, the aging population as well as the Affordable Care Act has created a increased demand for nurses. In 2014, the NLN did a survey on nursing faculty and found that 78% of associate's degree programs and 64% of baccalaureate degree programs had to turn away qualified nursing students because they lacked the faculty. The NLN survey in 2015 showed that there was 34% of a faculty vacancy rate in baccalaureate programs and 28% faculty vacancy rate in uh, associate degree programs. So my study was a cross-sectional correlational study. I used a survey to determine the relationship between faculty, faculty and civility um, and job satisfaction and intent to leave. So through my research, I found that there is 1,869 accredited nursing schools in the United States. And I'm proud to say that I went to every single one of their websites to look at their school and look at their faculty members and whatnot. I had originally decided to do a stratified random sampling um, from nursing programs. And so I was looking at 
stratifying the nursing program type, so whether it was a diploma program, which there are still a few in the country, uh, an associate's degree program, or a baccalaureate program. I also wanted to stratify the sample based on geographic distribution. So was it in the Northeast, the South, the Midwest, or the West? Because I was inviting entire nursing program faculty to participate, that would be cluster sampling. And when I did the util, um, Cohen statistical power of analysis, it showed that I needed 85 participants in order to answer my research questions. Unfortunately, my methodology had to be modified because I had a very poor initial response rate to the first method. And so I had to change to a convenient sample. So the data was collected using a survey and I used um, Cynthia Clark's Workplace Incivility Civility Survey. And so that has um, some questions on demographics such as age, gender, years of teaching, um, level of degrees. And then it also has 23 questions regarding behaviors that might be considered um, incivil. So the participant would have to classify to what degree they felt this behavior was incivil, and then to what degree had they experienced this behavior in the last um, year. I also added open-ended questions because I really wanted to get a better feel for um, what type of incivility were the participants experiencing, and then what was the emotional and physical impact of that incident. And then lastly, I added questions that talk, that asked about job satisfaction, intent to leave, and how that relates to faculty to faculty incivility. So initially, the questionnaires were electronically sent to randomly selected nursing programs and a cover letter was sent to the dean asking her to share the questionnaire um, with her faculty members. Um, all of the faculty members of that program were invited to participate and these were randomly selected nursing programs. Um, confidentiality was ensured because again, this is a sensitive topic and I knew there might be some reservations. So of the initial um, questionnaire sent out, I only received uh, 17 responses or 17 completed questionnaires. So then I ended up going to a convenience sample where I recruited attendees at a national nursing educator conference. And so the sponsors gave me a table and I was able to sit there with my surveys and basically it says here, do you have 15 minutes to spare to help a doctoral student? And I was very surprised that people stopped and answered my survey. So I analyzed the data using descriptive statistics. I also looked at the product moment correlation coefficient for looking at the relationship between job satisfaction, faculty to faculty and civility, and intent to leave. And then I did a secondary analysis, um, a chi-square analysis, looking at the demographic variables and how that relates to faculty to faculty and civility, um, job satisfaction and intent to leave. Now, of course, there were some ethical issues in that there could be some sampling bias. Um, and what I found was that there was sampling bias in both methodologies that I use. So there could be sampling bias because it's a convenient sample. So the people who answered the survey might be different than the people who did not. Um, but also there could have been a sampling bias in the deans who may have chosen not to share the survey or ask participation from their faculty members um, based on the content or based on the study itself. Um, all of the participants received informed consent and they were able to withdraw at any point in time. And by completing the survey, they were giving consent. And then again, because it is a sensitive topic, I was very cautious about confidentiality. And so I did not collect any kind of information on um, identifying information. I used only aggregate data and uh, the surveys were all submitted anonymously. So results of the demographic data analysis. So you can see by the age distribution, it was fairly well distributed, but you can see that 55% of the participants were over the age of 50. So most likely will retire within the next 10 to 15 years. 
um, as far as gender in male or in nurse educator population, males represent about 6.4% of the population. And so males were underrepresented in this sample. As far as race, um, nurse educators are, white nurse educators are about 81% of the population. So I, my sample lacked diversity. As far as level of education, you can see that the majority of the uh, participants held a master's degree, um, but the faculty census survey in 2017 showed that all rank nurse educators, about 3% hold a bachelor, bachelor's degree, 59% hold a master's degree, and 38% hold a doctoral level degree. So my sample was pretty representative of the population. Uh, there was a pretty even split between non-tenure track and then the tenure track tenured faculty. And there was also an even split between public and private institutions. You can see in the years of teaching in higher education, there is a great deal of variability. And also the participants who taught in the diff various degrees or various programs. So the majority did teach in either the associates or baccalaureate degree programs, but the numbers don't all add up to 100 because it's possible that a participant could um, teach in more than one program. And the majority of the participants did teach fully face-to-face, -face, so 55%. Looking at demographic or the geographic location, um, the number of programs in the Midwest is about 21% and the number of programs in the West is about 19%. Therefore, Midwest was pretty overrepresented in this sample and the West was underrepresented. Um, looking at the location of the institution, it was pretty variable between all of the different um, locations. And then also looking at nursing program enrollment. Again, the majority of the participants taught in programs that were less than 300 students. So I want you to take a moment and you can use your chat box. Well, you don't have to use it right now, but I want you to think about an episode of faculty to faculty and civility that you may have either experienced personally or have witnessed. So kind of think about what happened and then think about how it made you feel. So I want you to take a minute, think about that. We're going to come back to that in a minute. So the first research question was, what is the incidence of faculty to faculty incivility in nursing programs in the United States? And so again, looking at those 23 questions that ask the participants to rank kind of like the most uncivil behaviors. The first was making racial, ethnic, sexual, gender, or religious slurs about anyone. Next was making physical threats and then making personal attacks or threatening comments. So these were considered the most uncivil behaviors and fortunately they were also the least frequently experienced by the participants. When asked about the least uncivil behaviors, engaging in secretive meetings behind closed doors, consistently interrupting you or a coworker, and then using personal technology in a way that disrupts or interrupts interactions. And these were considered the least uncivil behaviors and oftentimes were the most frequently experienced. The next question asked the participants to what degree incivility was a problem in the, their workplace. And what you can see here is 51% responded that incivility was a moderate to severe problem in their workplace. And only 6% say that it's not a problem at all. So participants were asked to describe an incidence of incivility that they had experienced. And Dr. Clark had taken an the questions from her incivility um, uh, survey and just des describe them as three different constructs. So the first construct was hostility toward an individual and 46 of the participants described a behavior that fit into that category and the most common behavior was making rude remarks, put downs or name calling. The second construct is self-serving behaviors and 23 
participants described an incident that fell into that category. And the most common behavior was challenging you or a coworker's knowledge or credibility. And then the last construct is hostility toward the work environment. And 13 participants described an incident that fell into that category. And the most common was to consistently fail to perform his or her share of the workload or being inattentive or causing distractions during meetings. And what you can see is hostility toward the individual is the most common um, construct that is experienced by almost one to two times as much or frequently. So if you want to share your um, feelings, how did you feel or how did the incidents of incivility that you recalled make you feel? So you can use your chat box or if you care to share. I know some people might not want to. Do we even have a chat box? So the second research question was, what is the physical and emotional effects of faculty to faculty and civility? And so only two participants reported that they only had physical responses. And those were sleep disruption and headache. 10 participants. Pam, are, you, yes. are, you, are you able to see the, the comments that have come into the chat? I do not. Oh, OK. I had to pull it up. There's Shock. a few. OK. Oh, good. There's, there's a uh, made me feel sad, uncomfortable, shocked, unprepared. Great. Thank you. And 10 participants re reported both physical responses as well as emotional. And the remaining 70 reported all emotional responses. So for physical responses, oh dear, I quit. <laughs> That's a strong response. Uh, headache, stomach ache, disrupted sleep, and nausea were the most common physical responses. By far, again, emotional responses were often more than one, so a person would list more than one emotional response. Um, but anger, stress, self-doubt, low self-esteem, or questioning yourself for the decision you made to work there, um, feeling uneasy, uncomfortable, or feeling frustrated were the most common. But as I said, most people had a combination of more than one. Research question three was, what's the relationship between faculty, faculty, and civility and job satisfaction? And 20% of the participants responded that they felt dissatisfied or very dissatisfied with their job. And surprisingly, of these 20%, four had absolutely no intention of leaving their position, which was a little surprising that they would be very dissatisfied and then have no intention of leaving, which means there could be a um, negative workplace uh, environment. 50% of the participants responded that incivility was a moderate to significantly influences their job satisfaction. And then looking at the Pearson product moment um, correlation, it showed there was a moderately, moderately negative correlation between the perception of incivility, meaning as that perception of incivility goes up, um, job satisfaction goes down. The next question asks the relationship between faculty, faculty and civility and the intent to leave. And 20% of the participants responded that they frequently or constantly think about leaving their job. 32% of the participants responded that they are likely to leave their job within the next year or two. And 38% of the participants responded that faculty to faculty and civility moderately to significantly influences their intent to leave. And this showed that there was a moderate positive correlation between the two variables. So again, as the perception of incivility increases, the intent to leave also increases. So I did look at the open-ended questions and I'm gonna share some of the, the comments, but I pulled together some of the themes and some of the in themes that were identified was one participant said, I hate my job, a job I used to love. Several participants said we are afraid of the dean or that the dean was the source of incivility within their program. 
another participant described an incident where there was a gunshot in the classroom and the student, although the conduct committee recommended the student's expulsion, uh, the student was not expelled because the administrator who was the same race as the student uh, overturned the decision. Um, the faculty member developed um, post-traumatic stress disorder after this incident and felt extremely disrespected and unprotected by um, the administrator. Another participant said she was let go from a job after four years with no notice because of gossip. A new employee described this event. I asked my supervisor a question in a meeting with my coworkers about unbalanced learning experience. I was told very loudly to shut up and to come to see her in her office after the meeting. She screamed at me in front of two campuses worth of faculty members. I was horrified, I was embarrassed, hurt, and even unsure as my role as a worthy and useful employee. Another participant said that she was in a meeting and someone was trying to cut her off by making a cut it out motion over their neck when they had an idea, when she had an idea that they didn't like. And she said, you know, collaboration's impossible. I did not want to collaborate with this person any longer. The most severe episode that was described was by a participant who said that the, the incivility took place for over a year. Um, she was targeted by a particular bully who would um, criticize her and um, demean her in front of students, in front of other faculty members, and at the clinical site. Uh, this bully would sabotage her exam so students would get questions wrong. Uh, she would manipulate the clinical schedule so that the students, this faculty member students would be um, double booked for clinical. The faculty member became very anxious about being on campus and she was afraid to leave her office door open or use the restroom for fear of confrontation. She did take the, her complaints to her administrator as well as human resources and she was put into mediation with this bully. Um, and she said this only exacerbated the situation, it made it much worse. Um, eventually this culminated in an instance where the faculty member was crossing the parking lot and the bully was in her car and accelerated her car as she was driving toward the faculty member. So although it was not part of my original research questions, I really wanted to see whether or not there was any kind of relationship between demographic variables, such as age, gender, race, level of education, the job type, the years of um, teaching in higher education, the geographic location, um, or student enrollment with incivility. And what I found was there was no significant relationship between demographic variables and incivility. I also found that there was no relationship between the demographic variables and job satisfaction. And so what this really shows is that incivility is pretty much an equal opportunity um, event and that it doesn't really matter what your age or your level of education, it, it occurs across all um, variables. There was a relationship between um, age and intent to leave and also level of education and intent to leave. And this can be explained by the fact that many of the participants were older and so they are likely to retire within the next year or two, um, as well as those with higher levels of education are most likely older. So some of the limitations of the study was that it is self-reported survey data. And so it is possible that um, given the topic that participants may not answer completely truthfully for fear of retaliation. Um, I obviously learned that there are poor response rates to surveys. Um, the fact that it's a convenient sample, I think actually probably improved my representation of my sample. Um, I think I had a much more representative sample because it was a convenience um, sample as opposed to going through the deans. Um, I was really quite shocked that 11 out of the 96 participants who described an incidence of incivility described an inc incidence from their administrator or their dean, um, which is kind of shocking since it was a study on faculty to faculty incivility. 
again, it is a subject that's sensitive. And so there could be some selection bias for fear of, again, participating out of fear of retaliation. Um, the convenience sample surveys were all paper and pencil surveys, so they had to be transcribed into electronic format. And so there was the potential that errors could have been made. And then, as I said, the sample lacked diversity, so it was underrepresented in minorities as well as men. So again, you can use your chat box, but if you did not address the incidents of incivility that you had experienced, what prevented you from doing so? Well, I can tell you, both Tiffany and Kathleen, I sat in my hotel room and read these and I was absolutely sick to my stomach. I was really shocked by what I was reading. So there was a question on the survey that asked the participants what kept them from um, addressing incivility in the workplace. So what they identified as barriers was 61% responded fear of professional retaliation or and 42% feared personal retaliation. 40% responded that they preferred to avoid confrontation or conflict. 39% responded that they had minimal or no confidence in addressing incivility. And then 35% responded that they felt they lacked administrative support to address incivility. Participants were also asked what factors did they feel contributed to incivility? And so 74% responded stress. 67% respond, responded unclear roles, expectation, and imbalance of power. 57% responded entitlement and superiority. 56% responded demanding workloads, and 55% responded juggling multiple roles and responsibilities. Participants were also asked on what strategies they felt would improve um, civility in their workplace. So they were allowed to choose three of the given um, strategies. And so the most common answer, 81% said role modeling professionalism and civility. 67% said to establish codes of conduct that de, um, define acceptable and unacceptable behaviors, um, developing a culture of civility, raising awareness of incivility and civility, taking personal, personal responsibility and standing accountable for actions, and then adopting a zero tolerance policy. And so my recommendations based on my study was that faculty, administrators, and deans should all role model um, civil behaviors and that civility should actually be both acknowledged and, and recognized. There also needs to be clear policies and procedures to address incivility. And um, uh, Cynthia Clark and Ritter wrote a very good article that outlined how to develop the policies so that there needs to be a definition of what civil behavior is and a def definition of what is considered uncivil behavior. And then working with um, human resources, really developing procedures for how to address it. So there needs to be a re uh, procedure for reporting it and particularly maintaining confidentiality because again, the majority of the participants fear retaliation um, but also creating a stepwise approach of like a verbal warning, um, performance improvement plan, suspension, temporary leave, and even termination. So again, working through human resources may take it out of the program and ensure more confidentiality. Again, I think what was kind of shocking to me was the amount of administrators and deans who are part of the problem, who, who have uncivil behaviors. And so university and college administrators really need to provide oversight for deans and directors. Um, incivility can't really be addressed if it's occurring at an administrative level. And that came across by a lot of the participants' um, responses where they're like, 
what do we what can we do you know this is all the way up to the provost level um, there was a study by Casal who said that uh, resonant leadership style focuses on relationships and emotional intelligence and this has been shown to be very effective in creating a healthy work environment as well as a um, civil culture and so it indicates that that uh, leaders with high level of resident leadership qualities will have flu fewer episodes of incivility. Again, increasing self-awareness about what incivility is and how it affects other people. Um, Clark, Sattler, and Barbosa Likert uh, found that individuals lack self-awareness and that they, Clark developed a workplace incivility or workplace civility index and this tool really looks at self-reflection and assessments of one owns level of civility and what they found in their study was that many of their participants would rate themselves as having um, high levels of civility but then we would rate their peers as only having moderate levels of civility and so this disparity between how you view yourself and how you view your peers kind of indicates that lack of self-awareness and then lastly, because stress seems to really be the trigger for incivility, um, nursing programs really need to offer stress management workshops, work, workshops that deal with how to address incivility and how to promote self-care. So some of my recommendations for future research is I would be very interested in having a qualitative study of the physical and emotional effects of incivility and determine if there are any long-term effects. Um, I want you to think back to the incidents that you had recalled and how long ago did that happen and to what degree does that still, it's still part of your memory. Um, I think much of the literature right now is saying, okay, we've done enough of, you know, looking at the incidence of incivility, we need to really start looking at what are the effective strategies. So we've identified the problem, it's now trying to identify some of the solutions. How can we create a culture of civility? And then again, as this study really kind of did show that there is administrator to faculty incivility, I think we really need to identify that as, you know, what is the prevalence? What is the incidence? There's been very little research on administrator to faculty incivility. Um, so I think this is a problem. And again, it's a, we're not going to be able to address the problem until we identify how much of it is occurring at the administrative level. Oops. All right. So these are my references, and I'm going to look at some of the questions that were wondering. Twelve and seventeen. I did not do. Um, I did not send out to all thousand plus programs. I forget how many. It was like. 23 from each category and then maybe only three diplomas. So there's probably only about 40 schools that I sent um, the original survey out to. I just didn't get a very good response. So any questions or comments or discussion? Hi, Pam, Hi. it's Kathleen. Hi, Kathleen. Uh, I'm going to turn off my video because the light's kind of bad. But anyway, um, fabulous, uh, important study. Uh, boy, so many places or thoughts uh, are being generated. Uh, I'm sure all of us have observed this uh, in the workplace. I guess one thing that does surprise you in some respect is the administrative to faculty you know, point of view, where the expectation would be they'd at least have some um, ability to manage that better. <laughs> right. Uh, expectation that they should. Um, I also feel that it's often the band-aid that's offered when things are bad. It's like, okay, let's look at this, you know, like study the problem type thing anyway, and then nothing ever happens. So Exactly. That also is the issue that I think in terms of a low response 
because we don't expect anything to happen. You know, we don't expect anything to be done. Finally, my last comment about the violent nature of these threats is shocking, very shocking. Um, yes. I mean, that just is beyond uh, expectation, in my opinion. I can't imagine. But anyway, um, all of that said, I think a qualitative study would be amazing, and I'd be happy to help you. <laughs> oh, thank you. Somebody <laughs> help you with data analysis. I would love to be a part of that. Oh, thank um, you. Because it's important, and obviously, the sad news is I don't know that anything would happen, um, but it's just... I guess we need to inform, you know? Mm -hmm. I was very shocked by um, the results and uh, it was shocked too by the number of administrators. I mean, I was sat there and read these and they're in capital letters. We are afraid of the Dean or, you know, the, the provost turns a blind eye. Um, and it, it just was so disheartening to read that. When I actually did my mock defense with my chairs, they said pretty much the same thing, that it was very depressing and very sad. And I had to think about that. And I said, no, it, uh, it doesn't depress me or make me sad. It actually energizes me. And I know that I work with some of the most fantastic faculty in the planet. And most of us are great. They share everything. They are supportive. They're warm. They're kind. So it, this is a very few number of people who are actually very uncivil. At and the same time, if I, I'm sorry to interrupt, but oh, go ahead. my thought is in the current situation with this economic crisis that is knocking on every university door, these decisions are being made around without faculty involvement. Oh, absolutely. Influenced, uh, you know, people here today as well. Um, and you just have to wonder, you know, because everybody's afraid of their um, job. And that was one of the most interesting ones I recall hearing personally was at a meeting, and I can't remember the, it, who was in charge at the time, but the issue was related to um, the drop in our SE score. And it was shattering. You know, there was an earthquake that went off because how could uh, Drexel below, you know, 99, whatever percent return, whatever that was. And, and, you know, what I heard, and this is interpretive, and it's, of course, it's my perception, but it was when, and, and I haven't heard, it was Penny who raised the question and said, because the next statement was, well, we got to increase our class sizes, and we got to work harder, and we got to this, and we got to that. And, and Penny raised her hand and said, does anybody think that's a good idea to eat? increase class sizes when we're saying they're, they're lessening, you know, the scores, maybe there should be more attention around something else, who knows. But the response that I interpreted was be quiet and be glad you have a job. And I just thought, oh, what, uh, you know, what put down, you know, what, and again, it was, it was an administrator to a faculty in a very public space and, as mentioned, it's my own interpretation. I, I own that, but I was shocked. Okay, so, so I'll be quiet. Put your hands down. Are there any? Any other questions, comments? This is Rocky. I've got a question. few questions. Okay. Um, <clears throat> my, two questions, Pam. My first one is just out of curiosity. Um, were you able to tease out um, or did you look at a perceived type of incivility? Um, I, I don't think when, it, when it's violent, that's not perceived, that's actual. But, but um, when you're at a meeting, you know, I'm thinking at the bedside sometimes that because of the stress level, voices get raised, things are said like, I don't have time for this right now, or be quiet. Were you able to tease out, um, try to look at whether it was a, um, just maybe a bad communication style versus actual incivility or is bad communication classified as incivility? I think that that's a very good question and I think it all comes down to perception because what somebody might and I when I presented this with my chair and my committee members my one committee member said well I've made that 
motion, but I do it in a kind of like, stop talking. This is not the time to be talking about this. And I think she does it in a much more caring kind of way. So I think it's the perception of how it's the message is either being sent or received. Um, <clears throat> I think some people will be, you know, more offended by incivility than others. I was kind of surprised at some of the some of the participants would not classify a verbal or physical threat as incivility. And I kind of had to think about that as to why they wouldn't. But I think the only rational I could say was that to them, it's so beyond uncivil behavior. It's in a whole category of its own. Does that make sense? Sure, sure. Thank you. And if you don't mind a follow up. Sure. Um, regarding strategies to respond to incivility, um, had you have you begun looking at that? Did any of your participants offer, you know, with here's what happened when someone was uncivil to me and, and here was something I did immediately versus it sounds like others went to the provost and didn't get anything. Did you collect any information on what was attempted and what was successful and what wasn't? I did not ask that specific question, but there were some participants who said, yeah, I address it. I address it immediately and I don't have an issue with that or I feel very confident with um, addressing incivility when it occurs. So I don't, I didn't ask a specific question as to what they did to address it, but um, there are some people out there who have no problem with that whatsoever. Thank you. Very nice presentation. I, I enjoyed it and learned quite a, quite a lot. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you for coming here. Hi, Pam. It's Mary Kay. Hi, Mary Kay. Now, this is the second time I heard this because I heard it when you were a little bit more nervous than this time, which is good. <laughs> <laughs> I, heard I have a question, though, and I don't remember if I heard or not. Did you question anybody? Do they have incivility programs in their institutions? Like a policy and procedure? No, like actually in service or something that they keep up abreast with. Again, that was, um, it was the question asked if what strategies they thought would be helpful. It did not really specifically Sorry, ask if they, they had, had them. Um, reading some of the responses or the descriptions of the incidents, it's, I got a kind of feeling whether or not there was a policy or procedure. Um, and it didn't seem like there was a whole lot. Again, I think a, a lot of what came out of my research is that there's just not a lot of support. Um, so uh, even well. if there was a policy, they feared retaliation, even if they you know, tried to pursue it. Well, it's, as you know, it's hard to get something such as an incivility policy plus a program to get sure. running because it kind of stalls somewhere in the, mm -hmm. the hierarchy up, so. But there is a huge call from nursing researchers that we address this problem in nursing education. I totally agree. Good job. You did great. Oh, thank you. I learned something each time. So real oh, good. good. Hey, Pam, it's Jane. Hi, um, Jane. Fabulous job. I mean, I thank you. It, it was, um, yeah, I, I wanted to ask, you know, was there anything that was surprising? But it, I think you answered that. The thing that was surprising was that it was top down, which I guess is consistent with um, nursing clinicians' experiences of incivility, that it's a more experienced nurse bullies a less experienced nurse. Right. Right. I mean, I wouldn't say that. I mean, there was a little bit over 10% described incidences where it did, you know, it was an administrator to faculty or director or provost or dean. Um, enough for me to say, though, that that is an area that needs further research. Yeah. Um, but I think even to Tiffany's point here, I think if there were more non-white participants, I would expect that there would be a change in um, the, the perception of incivility. Um, as well as job satisfaction and intent to leave. And it was very interesting because I was sitting there at the table so I could see minority nurse educators. There wasn't a whole lot of men there, but there were certainly minority nurse educators and they would kind of like look at me and then they'd move away. And so I'm not sure if they were fearful or 
I'm not sure where that came from, but the opportunity to recruit was certainly there, um, but for whatever reason, they chose not to. And yes, it could be power differences. Um, it's the whole issue of incivility is very much surrounding fear and fear of retaliation, fear of disclosure, losing your jobs, whatever. And I think that fear will increase as a, the economic situation is worsened. Yeah, I agree. Yeah, very well done, Ken. Very well. Oh, thank you. Oh, okay. wait, I'm sorry. I did have one other question. Sure. What publication? Have you? Actually, I did submit um, an article to the Journal of um, Nursing Scholarship, and that just covers the descriptive statistics, and then I'm going to do a second article on the job satisfaction and intent to leave. Okay, because I think that um, Gloria's journal would be very interested in this. Um, Actually, Gloria did reach out to me. She's writing something, um, but she was asking me about um, yeah, my I research. Yeah, I, I strongly suggest that you give this, you give some port, you think about publishing with her. She has, is, I think you probably know, she has a very international audience. Yes. This is um, an issue which is not limited. Just oh, to, absolutely not unique to nursing, not unique to the United States. Yeah. Very well done. Thank you. Thank you. This is true, Tiffany. They do pick on, and it's very interesting, people who are targeted as a, a target of bullies oftentimes turn into bullies themselves because they'll just go after someone else who's weaker. Um, I think some of it is being threatened by that person. So again, if a new faculty member comes in with great ideas, uh, an older faculty member might feel the need to push them down. Um, and sometimes it's done in very subtle ways. So you don't even realize that you've been a victim of incivility or uncivil behavior. Um, I do feel that they do go after certain people. Again, that one insta instance was very targeted and um, you know that bully really just targeted that one person, which is very scary. Well, thank you. Oh, thank you very much. Well, thank you, everyone. I appreciate your time. And it's nice to think about something other than the budget or COVID or <laughs> anything else. <laughs> well, thank you so much, uh, Dr. McGee. Uh, let's, uh, thank you so much for joining us today for today's Tuesday topic. Uh, uh, please you. visit the website to register for the next one. We've got another one next week uh, at 12 noon.